judge was cool. OK, let's talk about intelligent design. This is kind of a long warm up, but the background was, was fun to hear. Um, now, I grew up in the upper Midwest. I believe in the thumper principle. If you can't some, say something nice, don't say nothing at all, right? So I'm going to say something nice about intelligent design. I'm not going to say a whole lot of things that are nice about intelligent design, but I will say something nice about intelligent design, and I'm serious about this. Because I think the whole intelligent design controversy is very important for a couple of reasons. It reminds us of the importance of keeping the door of science open to theists. I'll talk a little bit later on about the cultural renewal part of intelligent design and the motivation for this anti-evolution position. Largely is the idea that science means God had nothing to do with it. And the intelligent design people believe that evolution is a totally materialist phenomenon. God can have nothing to do with it. And when a high school teacher teaches evolution, the high school teacher is telling the students to take their God and shove it. It's not happening. But I think we need to be reminded that we should be sure that when we teach evolution, whether at the college level or the high school level, that we be sure to not present it in a way that limits the ability of a student who is religious to accommodate his or her religious views to the science we are presenting. This actually involves a very important principle uh, called materialism, which is very confusing because we use it in two ways in science and philosophy. One way that we use the term materialism is in science. We talk of something called methodological materialism. Now, materialism is the idea that matter and energy uh, are used to explain the natural world. And in science, this is a methodology. We restrict ourselves to natural cause. Science is a limited way of knowing, I like to tell people. We are limited to explaining just the natural world. We're not telling you how to treat each other, morals and ethics. We're just trying to explain the natural world. And we limit ourselves to natural cause. The reason we limit ourselves to natural cause, to methodological naturalism, is not because all scientists are atheists, because they aren't. The reason we limit ourselves to natural cause is because the essence of science is testing ideas against the natural world. Just because an idea sounds good doesn't mean you accept it. You have to test it. An essential part of testing, as you learned in seventh grade, is to hold constant certain variables so that you can see the effect of changes and see whether your explanation really is the one that, that, that explains the phenomenon you're trying to, to uh, explain. You have to hold constant. We call that control. It's, don't like that term. But holding constant certain variables is very important in being able to test a theory, test a hypothesis. If there is an omnipotent force in the universe, you cannot hold its actions constant. God, please don't act on these two cornfields. I want to make sure that it's the fertilizer that makes it grow. You can't put God in a test tube, right? You cannot test explanations involving supernatural cause, involving an omnipotent cause, because any outcome you get is compatible with the actions of that omnipotent cause. That's what omnipotence is all about. It's very useful. But because of that, because we can't test statements about God's actions, we just leave them out of science. But as my friend Robert Pennock said, another Michigan um, scholar, to say nothing of God is not to say that God is nothing. When we talk about cell division in biology, we don't say, you know, here are the enzymes that cause the chromosomes to line up in the midline, and God had nothing to do with it. And here are the enzymes that form the spindle fibers, and God had nothing to do with it. And here are the enzymes that make the cell break apart, and God had nothing to do with it. Of course not. When we talk about evolution, we talk about the phylogenies. We talk about the tree of life. We talk about how bears and dogs had a common ancestor in the Miocene. We're not saying, and God had nothing to do with it, because we don't talk about God acting or not acting when we're wearing our scientist hat. If, as a religious individual, you want to believe that God wanted bears and dogs to emerge out of a common ancestor, there's nothing in science that's going to say you can't say that. But there's nothing in science that you can use to test that either. 
and it's not a scientific idea because it's not testable. Okay? That's methodological materialism or methodological naturalism. There's also something called philosophical materialism. This is a philosophical view, not a scientific view, that says matter and energy is it, folks. There is no God, there are no ancestor spirits, there's no uh, supernatural whatsoever. Matter, energy, and their interactions is all that the universe is composed of. This is a philosophical view, it's held by a lot of people, but it is not a view that is compelled by science. Okay? I happen to hold that view, but I can't say that science proves that point of view. I have to say I hold that view because of my own particular background and what I think about reality. But a theist can, use, can look at the same empirical evidence that I look at, and given his particular philosophical view, see the hand of God and so forth, I don't. Science is an equal opportunity substratum for philosophy, okay? It does not compel either theism or disbelief or, or philosophical materialism. But there are a lot of scientists around who kind of get this mixed up. And the creationists love to quote these folks. Uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, um, uh, Dennett, uh, William Provine. Uh, I'll give you an example from a Scientific American article by a friend of mine, uh, Michael Shermer, who wrote, he was talking about the Gallup poll, a paltry 12% accept the standard scientific theory that human beings have developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God had no part in this process. Excuse me? When did that become part of the standard scientific theory? The standard thi scientific theory is that evolution happened, that living things shared common ancestors. The standard scientific theory is that living things descended with modification from common ancestors. Full stop. Period. If you believe God guided the process, that's fine. That's a theological belief. If you believe God had nothing to do with the process, that's fine. That's a philosophical belief. Neither are compelled by the scientific data. Michael is simply wrong when he says this. And the other scientists who make similar statements simply have not thought this through. Um, so let's get to intelligent design. I know you've been waiting. Actually, I have been talking about it all along, but that's okay. Intelligent design basically <coughs> has two points that it makes. It makes some scientific and philosophical points, and it claims under this rubric that it can detect the evidence for design. It claims that using two methods, you can distinguish those things in nature that are a result of natural cause from those things in nature that cannot be explained through natural cause. One of these is irreducible complexity, and the other is something called the design inference. The second component of intelligent design is what they call cultural renewal. I'll try to talk briefly about both of these. Let's talk about the design inference, William Dembski's idea that he presented in his book, The Design Inference. 